Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, here with you for another half hour of discussion of politics and current events from a libertarian perspective. Tonight, my guest is the economist Cameron Weber, the author of Economics for Everyone, which he says explains the main and basic ideas of economics. Now, um, Cameron, let's uh, just start, if you would, by defining our terms. Uh, what exactly is economics? I understand that it's just the study of money and how money works, but it's more than that, right? Uh, yes, Joseph. Well, economics is many things to many people. <laughs> Uh, but basically, o economics has been defined as different things over time as the profession has changed over time. Originally, economics was called political economy, and it was based on moral philosophy and it based on philosophy. And that was Adam Smith who, who wrote about uh, Adam Smith wrote about something called the Society of Perfect Liberty, okay. which is. But is it basically about money? I it's it's not about money. It's it's about how resources are allocated in a society, how resource resources are produced and distributed in a society. And money is just a means by which resources are exchanged. I see, okay. Yeah, money, money th there's a type of economics called monetary economics, but that's just a subset of economics. Economics is a larger way to look at society. Okay. And uh, if you consider yourself a, a political person, somebody who's trying to right. develop a personal political philosophy, then why is it important to uh, know something about economics? Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Economics, like I said, it originally was called political economy. It, it was part of politics. And then over time, and especially in the 20th century, economics tried to define itself as a, as a science, as, as more of, a, say, a mathematical science and a, a, a hard science like physics with, with hard concrete laws. But uh, now social scientists are honest social scientists are, are realizing that, that, that it actually is. It's political economy. And economics, in, in partnership with politics, determines how society's resources are divided. What is the role for a government? What is the role for a city? Now, when for you're a talking about the role of government, taxes, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, Has the government always, as right. far as we know, played a role in the economy of of a state or a nation or a city or whatever, or uh, is that a fairly new development? Um, <laughs> as, as far as I know, and uh, the all the great economists, starting with Adam Smith, the most famous one, Adam Smith didn't like the system of mercantilism where the state would determine who could trade what with whom. He didn't like that. He thought that was unfair. So he wrote about. So even in Adam Smith's time, about 250 yeah. years ago, right. the um, the government was taking a very active role in the um, picking and choosing winners in the economy. Yes. And how how long had that gone on before? Well, as long as society has <laughs> has existed, pretty much. I mean, in Roman in Roman times, the, there was the select few who were who were the politicians, and then the the outside circle who were the actual workers and traders. I mean. Yeah, and then I guess you had something similar in India with its caste system, which is, of course, hundreds and hundreds of years old. Right. Pol political structures, political structures always have have control, and it's and it's up to an individual to fight for their for their own individual liberty. Okay. <laughs> well, now tell me, are there? I, I'm a libertarian, so I I tend to be rather dogmatic in my view right, that right, the government right, should right, have right. little or no role. Right. in economics, but um, obviously there are other points of view yes, all sir. along the spectrum. Maybe you could talk about what are some of the advantages and disadvantages to the government right. playing a strong right. role right. In, in the economy. Okay. I also am a libertarian, and, and by recognizing myself as a libertarian, that helps me realize I have a bias. I may have a political bias towards limited government, so that helps me evaluate my economic analysis more honestly. I know I have a bias, so it allows me to almost be more honest in my evaluation of economic problems. Okay. To, to get to get to get to your um, 
to get to your uh, answer. Okay, w what I've done in my book in, in uh, Chapter 5, I, I've created something called the Economic and Paternalistic Roles for Government. Okay. okay? It's, it's a chapter in the book uh, describing on the left-hand side what's called the economic role for government, which public goods and market failure. And, and in my book, I dis most of the things I describe in my book, I try to say most economists agree on this. Mm -hmm. So, I'm What are public goods uh, for, for the sake of this discussion? Uh, right. So most economists agree that the, there's an uh, economic role for government in the economy for public goods and market Could failure. you tell us what public goods are for the sake of this discussion? Uh, yes. A public good is something that would, would help, us, help a society, uh, protect a society, and is good for a society, but the market would not provide it on its own. You're talking about things like police or national defense? Or exactly. Things of that yeah, sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most common example that people use, the most common example, is national defense. And a, a public good is people have, people need national defense, and nation needs a national defense. Although uh, I have known some <laughs> very extreme libertarians who would argue even of course, that point. Of course. It would depends if you're a Hobbesian or, or a Lockean and w w how much national defense, and, and, and you're right. But assuming we need a national defense, people would have the incentive to say I, that they would be willing to pay less than they actually would pay. In other words, we need a national defense, let's all pay for national defense, but w n people together would not put up enough money to pay for the national defense because there's no incentive to say how much it's really worth it to you to have national defense. You're, there's really for no way for you to price it. And besides, uh, like, 999 times out of 1,000, you don't really need it. It's just yeah, yeah. that once in a thousand occurrences. Well, uh, unfortunately, it's not really national defense anymore, is it, Joseph? Uh, not these <laughs> days, no. no. So, so a public good then is something that the government provides be, uh, because the market does not. Okay. And, and it's also a public good is also something that you can't exclude somebody from. So, everyone pays for national defense, but and and n no one can be excluded from it. In other words, if you chose not to pay for national defense, then I, as the president or dictator or whatever would not be in a position to say, okay, we'll take care of everybody, right. we'll defend everybody, except you, sucker. Exactly. It wouldn't work that way. Exactly. Right. So, so that, that, that's called a public good. It's, uh, and parks are also public goods, oftentimes considered public goods. Okay. Now, you mentioned market failure, that the right. government has a role in uh, controlling or perhaps preventing market failures. Yeah. Uh, could you explain that, that concept? Yeah. Uh, well, you should also know there's also something called government failure. But first, I'll talk. <laughs> uh, first, I'll talk about a market failure. A market failure. A market is two people coming together to exchange privately goods or services. I sell you a pen. You give me money. I get the money. You get the pen. That's it. We both win. Fair exchange. But. A market failure is when there's costs associated with a private transaction that aren't fully captured privately. And the most uh, common example there is pollution in a, f in a factory. Somebody, uh, a factory is making something, it's polluting the environment, it's polluting the waterways, yet the factory is selling you the pen, you're buying, buying the pen yet other people are affected by our private transaction. And that's when the market fails to capture all the costs associated with that transaction. Okay, so in that case, the government might step in and perhaps control the, uh, the side effects or, yeah. or uh, cause well, one party or another to pay for the... Uh, yeah, yeah, the there, there's, yes, so sir. There, there's many different types of market failures. In the example that I, uh, that I gave on pollution, what you would do is there's <laughs> there's the libertarian way and then there's the coercive government way okay the coercive government way would be to go in and to tax the corporate to tax the polluter and say you are polluting 
the waterway, we are going to tax you and then take that tax money and clean up the waterway. Whereas the libertarian way would be to uh, simply sue the, the polluter in court. One way would be to, to, yes sir, one way would be to enforce the property rights of the people living in the area around where the pollution is. The people who have the property rights to that area bring a, a, a case in court or an even better way is for uh, a good community citizen, a good, a good company, and a, a companies are oftentimes being rewarded now, especially with carbon neutral and carbon negative and green industries are being rewarded for acting in public good manner by negotiating freely to clean up pollution. Okay. To negotiate freely to, to improve their production techniques. Okay, very good. Now let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum, the paternalistic yeah. type of government, <laughs> the paternalistic role that government right. could play right. in the economy. That includes things like um, social security, or some right. sort of retirement security, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. social welfare programs. Okay. And it seems to me that we have got all of that already and that the United States has really gone clean over to the uh, far end of the spectrum. Okay. Am I right or wrong? Yes, Can sir. it get worse? Uh, <laughs> just so, you know, <laughs> okay, you, you initially introduced me as an economist, so I, I have to fulfill that role and say that yesterday I had a discussion with some friends of mine and they said, Cameron, you should not use the term paternalistic. Paternalistic is a pejorative, value-laden word that, uh, that is a libertarian-based word, right? So I shouldn't use that word. Uh, the word I'm surprised they didn't say sexist. <laughs> what, what they, um, <laughs> maternalistic, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so basically, anything to the right of public goods and market failure, we'll, we'll call that the welfare state. And uh, that's what economists call the welfare state. Anything that's not the market failure of public good that the government does is the welfare state. And as you know, the welfare state has developed over time in the 20th century and has actually always been with us, the welfare state. In fact, Adam Smith called for public uh, education. Well, yeah. some sort of social welfare has been around ever since the yeah. civilization, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. E even, even, the, even the most, uh, even the most individual liberty-oriented economists, the Austrian School for Economics, thought of a role for government in, in negative income taxes as a safety net. I mean, so you, there's, 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 and then you also have federal government or national governments and local governments and state governments. So each of these things need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. But yes, anything that's not a public good or a market failure is, is the welfare state. Okay. Now, just for our viewers who don't really know a lot about um, politics, about libertarian principles, about collectivist principles, could you right. very basically tell us what are some of the upsides and some of the downsides of having a very paternalistic government? Y yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Incentives matter. That's a, uh, we were talking earlier about, about words and phrases and writing, and incentives matter is a phrase that was invented by a sociologist at Columbia University. Incentives matter. And so what happens when paternalism, in, in my book, I, I define paternalism as, as uh, people using government to protect them from their own actions or as a substitute for acting in their own self-interest. When the government steps in and, and acts like a parent to an individual, an individual never grows up. Okay, and <laughs> so under the, the it's the principles of paternalism that have given us things like uh, laws against uh, drug use, yeah. uh, compulsory education, Compu uh, uh, yeah, some yes, various but, things that some people would say are good, some people would not say are good. What, what, what it, 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 it creates infant, an infantile society, for one thing, a, a non-risk-taking society. People don't learn from their mistakes. You don't grow as an individual. You, 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 but you, you immediately started on the right-hand side and talked about welfare programs and Social Security. Social Security, I personally dislike a lot. And, and um, I, I, it tells you that w when you're 62 and a half years old, you're no longer productive 
member of society. You're, you're put out the pasture. <laughs> they, the government basically pays you not to be productive anymore. What does that do to your mentality? What does that do for your frame of reference? And it's important to point out, I think, that uh, FDR's social security system back in the 1930s was not originally meant that way. It was meant to be a safety net for uh, for widows and orphans who were left right. suddenly destitute by the death of the okay. of the main breadwinner. But then it got corrupted, didn't it? It it's evolved into something more more much corrupted. different from what Roosevelt had envisioned. Am I right about that? Uh, y it sounds like you know more about that than I do. But, but I do know that r that it happened, what, 40, 50 years ago. People are living... More like 70 years se ago. Yeah, people are living 20, 30 years longer. People are reaching their creative apogees at age 60. They're not ready to retire. They're not ready to, to, to go fishing. <laughs> All right, now my big problem with Social Security is uh, simply that the government takes a significant percentage of your income uh, every year oh, yeah. saying, we know better than you how to manage this money so that it'll be there for you yes. in your dotage. It's a scam. And, and I'm saying, when I look at the way the Social Security system is run, I, I say to myself, my goodness, I could handle that fund a lot better myself. Let, let me right. put that money into a private account for yes, myself. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes. And I could manage it better. Yes, sir. Um, there is is that, that a common complaint? Uh, that, that, that is a, that's a very good economic complaint, yes. Between retirement, between Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, Every American family is in debt with the IOU promises by the government to the tune of $440,000. So every family, if, if the government was made to, made to pay for everything that has been promised to people, every family is in debt to almost a half a million dollars. So that in itself okay. is just but There's talk immoral. now. There's immoral. talk now about the um, Social Security fund actually running out of money before too long. Now, I oh, don't yeah. know if that's just alarmism or if it really no, is a possibility. Th th there there is no Social Security fund. All, mm. uh, money comes into the government and money, is, no, it comes into the Treasury Department and it gets spent by the Treasury Department. There is no separate Social Security fund that's going to run out. It's just, uh, just net present value IOUs which have to get paid as people as the payments are made. Do you mean to tell me that that money is not at least invested by the government in no, some profitable... No, no, no. The government is in debt. I don't know. I don't know. We, what, what is our deficit? No, no. The government runs a deficit. There's, it's not being invested in anything. And even if it was being invested in something, there is no right, there is no right for the government to be making private investments anyway because that that in, in itself that case, is socialism. In that <laughs> case, why is the social security system so popular? Because I realize that I'm in the minority saying that it should be got rid of. Why? Because people are used to it. People are afraid of change. I, because it's been around for such a long time. People don't think about it. People can't wait to get their $400 a, a month when they're 62 and a half years old. Because people work uh, their their life because be, because we've had such a paternalistic government that we've create we've removed creative entrepreneurial people and we've created tax paying government feeding machines. If you ask okay, me. Okay. Well, can you think <laughs> of a feasible way to turn this around? Uh, well, short of an actual uh, <laughs> revolution, <laughs> revolution feature. No, no, no. It has, it, it, it has to be things like you and I are doing exactly right now, which is talking about these things. The, what, what, what I, what I'm consider myself doing is, is public service, trying to educate people about why it's social security isn't good. They're not saving for themselves. The money that they're giving the government isn't earning anything. Okay, well, let they're me not give you, creating wealth. Let me give you then the standard non-libertarian argument, which runs something like this. Okay, I'm saving for my retirement, but most people are just not smart enough to do that. Or they just don't make enough money in the first place to save anything. And even if they could, they're just 
too dumb. They live for the moment. They don't think to the, for the, of the future. The government has to do something to protect those poor schnooks. That's the standard argument. What do you wow. say to that? What, what do I say to that? Uh, the same answer that I gave before is there has to be marginal changes through education. People need to be, there needs to be reform. People need to be made aware that their money is not being invested. People, for the, what did you call them, the, sh the schmucks? They need to let the government invest, invest their money in every single stock there is. In, a, in an entire index. Instead of the government picking and choosing funds, let their money be invested in economically productive assets in the economy writ large instead of pay the government picking and choosing individual ones. L let their, let, I don't have a personal problem of small percentages of money being taken out for Social Security, but it's not small percentages of money. It's 12.5 percent of, of people's money goes into this retirement. They don't, they don't know that. Do you know that 12 percent of your income? Well, yes. It's, I've, well, I've you know more it. than, It's actually more than 12 percent. I find that out the hard way every time I do my taxes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, 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 uh, so, so it's not only, it's not only the, the 20 percent income tax you're paying and, and the 6 percent sales tax and the, the 9 percent state income tax, you're paying 12 percent Social Security tax. Well, uh, in my case, until recently, it was more than that because I was self-employed. I had right. to pay a, something like a 15.3 percent tax. And now that I'm incorporated, it's slightly less, but it's yeah. still pretty darn high. Well, wh when, I, when I tutor people, luckily, I don't pay taxes. <laughs> 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 but, but I don't do that very often. So, but, uh, well, that's one way to get Pay, get around paying social security and, 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 and welfare to work under the radar, but not everybody can do that. And, and that also is not right. You should live in a society where you want to pay taxes because you, because you believe in your society and what the government is providing for you. Well, now wanting to pay taxes that brings up another point. I have heard it said, and I am inclined to agree that no citizen should be taxed without his own consent. Now, do you think that that is correct? Do you think that's feasible? Um, you, you know, I think about this a lot, obviously, and I think in an ideal world, uh, uh, taxes would be a lottery. You would pay a lot, uh, lottery, you, like we have for these education lotteries where you, you go and you pay a dollar and you're, you're going to get a million dollars, but you never do, it, and it would be a voluntary lottery tax system. But Th 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 that 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 would be, prove to be too regressive. So therefore, you you tax the things that you want to discourage. You want to discourage consumption because you want to create wealth and investment. So what you should do is you should have a tax on consumption. Get rid of income tax and have a tax on consumption. That is to say, a general sales tax. Uh, you would have you would you would yes you would get rid of. That's one way to do it. You would get rid of income tax. You would get rid of income tax, which would free up a lot of money, and then you would charge more for consumption, more for sales tax, but then have a rebate of some of that sales tax to the poor. In other words, uh, uh, yes. Okay. Um, now, um, a lot of people would argue that a sales tax is regressive. That it um, it is regressive. That's why you have a a reimbursement to to, to which the, to, the to poor. which I say so what I uh, I am not in favor of progressive taxation any more than I can help. That brings up another point that uh, this or is a flat tax. And a lot of countries are using the flat tax and are outperforming the United States economically by using this flat tax. One, uh, can you point 15 to one or two percent. countries that do that? Well, there's uh, well Russia for one by their a little, a little well, they're, they're a little now. Of a Czech, now the Czech, isn't it? Czech Republic, mm -hmm. the Czech Republic. I, I believe Poland. I believe Ireland. Well, the Czech Republic is in not too bad shape right now, and of course, everybody knows what a success story Ireland has been in the past yeah. uh, decade or two. Yeah, They've yeah. been really no, but there, there's about 13 or 17 countries using the flat tax. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, another argument that I hear from collectivists is to say, well, it's all very well to talk about voluntary taxation. Um, and how uh, people would make charitable contributions on their own if it weren't taken from them to, to redistribute. But the, the argument goes, I wouldn't do that. If I got to keep my money, I would spend it on shoes, on vacations. Now, my yeah. reply to that is, what? It's your right, it's your property, it's your business. 
but uh, is there a better argument than that? Yeah, the better the better argument. I, I think we were talking about Poland earlier. Uh -huh. Poland had the first uh, parliament, I think, in in the 900s. That's right, they did. And, and it was a, it was a unanimous it was a unanimous parliament. Uh -huh. Every every politician had to agree to everything. That's right, and nothing got done, which was great. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you, you you're not going to have a lot of special interest paternalism in in a unanimous parliament. Right. So, I mean. Those those are I idealistic things, Joseph. The, 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 all we all we can do is attack one at a time, one issue at a time, one problem at a time. What would be the first issue you would tackle if you were uh, in a position of power at this point? Uh, social security. I, I would reform social security and make people aware that their money is not being invested. Okay. Making making people aware that the the, the twelve percent of that they are paying to the government is earning nothing. Okay. Basically. Uh, what then? And they you, may not get it anyway. Right. What then would you do with the people who have already paid a great deal of money into the system? How would you make sure that they got it back? There would be upfront costs. Okay. Yeah. And that and that that is how Social Security is reformed in countries is you pay people their money up front that they have paid. There's a lot of upfront costs, but in the long run it's worth it. So it would probably take uh, a certain amount of research and a certain amount of trial yeah, and error before these things you... Are easy. No, right. it would take a lot of research. And I think that's what most people find daunting analysis. about the whole system, about the whole study of economics is it is such a complicated matter and you really do have to devote a great deal of study to it. Yeah. And that's why I recommend your book, <laughs> Economics for Everyone. I suggest that um, everybody go out and um, get a copy of it, Economics for Everyone by Cameron Weber. And that's all the time we have. So join us next week. For now, I'm Joseph Dobrian saying good night from Hard Fire. Hard Fire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York, www.ny.lp.org. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.